All right, continuing onward. Let's do this. And the next section is developing the libraries functionality with test driven development. Okay. Now that we've extracted the logic into source libs.rs and left the argument collecting and error handling in source slash main.rs, it's much easier to write tests for the core functionality of our code. We can call functions directly with various arguments and check return values without having to call our binary from the command line. Feel free to write some tests for the functionality in the config new and run functions on your own. In this section, we'll add the searching logic to the mini grep program by using the test driven development TDD process. This software development technique follows these steps. One, write a test that fails and run it to make sure it fails for the reason you expect. Two, write or modify just enough code to make the new test pass. Three, refactor the code you just added or chained and make sure the tests continue to pass. Four, repeat step one. So just going over what they said here. Um, well, also here, they said feel free to write tests for config, new, and run on your own. Seemingly, this tutorial is not going to go over writing tests for them. I can understand that. But what they are going to demonstrate is test-driven development, TDD. And they went over the steps, but um, the philosophy behind test-driven development is that you write your tests first, and then you write your code to make sure your tests pass. So some of the benefits of a process like this is that it forces you to think about what you want your code to do. Like given this input, what are the output? What should the output be? And once you have that logic sort of down, um, like visually in your head, then writing code to satisfy it is, at least for me, much easier. This process is just one of many ways to write software. But TDD can help drive code design as well. Writing the test before you write the code that makes the test pass helps to maintain high test coverage throughout the process. Uh, uh, so what they're saying here is that there are many ways to go about writing code. TDD is just one of them. Um, but one of the benefits to writing TDD is that you have high test coverage, mainly because um, you're writing your test first. So everything that you, every code that you write post the test is already covered in your test coverage. And test coverage, for those who don't know, is um, how much of your source code is covered or ran or touched when you run your test. We'll test drive the implementation of the functionality that will actually do the searching for the query string in the file contents and produce a list of the lines that match the query. We'll add this functionality in a function called search. All right, writing a failing test. So I should probably move this over, get my editor up. Because we don't need them anymore, let's remove the print line statements from source lib and source main that we use to check the program's behavior. Then in source libs, we'll add a test module with a test function as we did in chapter 11. The test function specifies the behavior we want the search function to have. It will take a query and the text to search for the query in, and it will return only the lines from the text that contain the query. Listing 12-15 shows this test, which won't compile yet. All right, so let's do what they say. First, let's remove the print line statements. And we'll gone. That's an error that's needed, a config that's needed. And did lib? I guess this one, this statement's not needed. Still for space. All right, and then source.lib, ready, another module, just put this at the bottom. I'm gonna put the config tag. So we know it's a test. And mod test use super 
star. So everything above it is imported into this module. And then we're going to add a test. I need a hashtag first. Function, one result. And they say let query equal. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Duct let contents equal. And I haven't seen this before, but it looks like we can have multiple line strings if we put this slash there. OK. Um, technically, that might be a new line. So we should go all the way to the wall. Rust. Safe. Fast. Productive. And what just happened? Why did I get a bunch of other stuff? Period. I see. It's my editor. It's trying to change things. Contents. Get rid of this. Period. Space. And delete the space. And come down here. Pick three. Next, we use the assert equal macro. And we're saying the vector, ah, the vector is just going to have that line, say fast and productive. And it should have that line because duct is in productive. And this is the line that it contains. This is the line we can find duct. So we're going to put that here. And I can just copy and paste it. And the method which we haven't written yet is called search. And it's going to take in a query and contents. All right. And this won't compile yet because this doesn't exist yet. Moving onward. This test searches for the string duct. The text we're searching is three lines only one of which contains duct. We assert that the value returned from the search function contains only the line we expect. And that's what they have here. We have the query, contents. This is the three lines that we're searching through. This is what we're searching for. That only exists in this line. So one result, the test name, is asserting that we only get one result. We aren't able to run this test and watch it fail because the test doesn't even compile. The search function doesn't exist yet. So now we'll add just enough code to get the test to compile and run by adding a definition of the search function that always returns an empty vector. So now we'll add just enough code to get the test to compile and run by adding a definition of the search function that always returns an empty vector, as shown in listing 12.16. Then the test should compile and fail because an empty vector doesn't match a vector containing the line safe, fast, productive. And here's where they have it, libs. So just up here, I can do it under the run. Technically speaking, I don't think it matters where I put it. Public, because everybody has to be able to import you. Function, search. And it looks like we have a lifetime of A. Query, it's going to be a pointer to a string. Contents is also, well, one has a lifetime, but is a pointer to a string. 
and we return a vector that is a pointer to a string. And this is always going to return a vector, currently an empty vector. Uh, so a couple things to note, the lifetime variable, right? So we have a lifetime of A. The reason why we have a lifetime is because we're dealing with references. And now we need to know that the result is going to live, we need to know the lifetime of the result in reference to the thing that we're passing in. Our result is going to be a line or a few lines from contents. As such, the result and contents need to have the same lifetime. And that also explains why query doesn't have a lifetime uh, variable because query is not associated with the result. So let's run this test and see it fail. Ooh, uh, I think this cargo test. And here we go. Move this up a little bit. We have the left side wanted this, which is the correct answer. And the right side gave the empty, which is what we're returning now. Right here. And we had one test fail. And it looks like we only ran one test. Which there we only have one test right now, if that makes sense. Moving onward. Notice that we need an explicit lifetime A defined in the signature of search and used with the content argument and the return value. Recall in chapter 10 that the lifetime parameters specify which argument lifetime is connected to the lifetime of the return value. In this case, we indicated that the return vector should contain string slices that reference slices of the argument contents rather than the argument query. In other words, we told Rust that the data returned by the search function will live as long as the data passed into the search function in the contents argument. This is important. The data referenced by a slice needs to be valid for the reference to be valid. If the compiler assumes we're making string slices of query rather than contents, it will do its safety checking incorrectly. Um, so yeah, they just reiterated the lifetimes and why we did it on contents. Meh. If we forget the lifetime annotations to try to compile this function, we'll get this error. And I don't, we don't need to mock this, but let's just see what this says. One, they expected a lifetime. Help, this function return type contains a borrowed value but the signature does not say whether it is borrowed from query or contents. Yes, we need a lifetime. Moving onward. Rust can't possibly know which of the two arguments we need, so we need to tell it. Because contents is the argument that contains all of our text, and we want to return the part of the text that match, we know contents is the argument that should be connected to the return value using the lifetime syntax. Other programming languages don't require you to connect arguments to result values in the signature. Although this might seem strange, it will get easier over time. You might want to compare this example with the validating references with lifetime section in chapter 10. Now let's run the test, which I did, we saw this, great, the test fails exactly as we expected. Let's get the test to pass. All right writing code to pass the test. Currently, our test is failing because we always return an empty vector. To fix that and implement search, our program needs to follow these steps. Iterate through each line of the contents. Check whether the line contains a query string. If it does, add it to the list of values we're returning. If it doesn't, do nothing. And finally, return the list of results that match. Let's work through each step, starting with iterating through lines. Iterating through lines with the lines method. 
Rust has a helpful method to handle line-by-line -line iterations of strings, conveniently named lines. That works as shown in listing 12-17. Note this won't compile yet. Okay, so let's start that. Um, I guess well, the vector should still be here because we need to return something. So for line in contents, which is a string, dot, and we seem to have lines right there. And then we can do stuff in here. Do something with line. All right, so this is the first step, which was iterate through each line in the contents, and that's what this should do. The line method returns an iterator. We'll talk about iterators in depth in chapter 13. Oh, this isn't formatted properly, but okay, cool. We'll talk about iterators in depth in chapter 13, but recall that you saw this way of using an iterator in listing 3-5, where we used a for loop with an iterator to run some code on each item in a collection. That is true. Let's see where this link goes. Oh, that's chapter 3. I'm not going all the way back to chapter 3. Hmm. Searching each line for the query. Next, we'll check whether the current line contains our query string. Fortunately, strings have a helpful method named contains that does this for us. Add a call to the contains method in the search function as shown in listing 12-18. Note this still won't compile yet. Technically it would compile just because I left the vector there. They, they left it out. So just to show that, compiled and ran. Anyway, now we're gonna do something. So we're doing something with the line, right? So we can probably erase that. If line that contains query, and then in here we should be adding it to the vector, but they're gonna do that in the next step. Do something. Do something with line. All right. Storing matching lines. We also need a way to store the lines that contain our query string. For that, we can make a mutable vector before the for loop and call the push method to store a line in the vector. After the for loop, we return the vector, as shown in listing 12-19. And this is probably the end of it. So here, they have, well, first let's create the vector. Let mutable results equal a vector new, right? And then we're going to push our results. Push line. And at the end, results. So let's go over this in depth real quick. Make this bigger. Ah, uh, this is good for now. What is our search actually doing? It's taking in a query and contents. Query is gonna be the string that we're searching for. Contents are gonna, it's gonna be the string that we're searching in. And contents can have multiple lines. Because contents can have multiple lines, we can call contents.lines and it's going to return the first line, second line, third line, over and over and over. This is going to be the iterator. And then line is going to represent each line of those lines as we see them, like the first line, the second line, the third line. And if that line contains the query, we take that entire line and we push it to the results, which is a vector of, well, strings. And after we loop through contents and do this over and over and over again, we take the final list of results and we return it. Seems reasonable. Now the search function should return only the lines that contain query. And our test should pass. Let's run the test. 
Okay. See what happens. Cargo test. Interesting. I see zero test passed, zero test failed. Oh, that was for the, uh, I forgot about that. So up here we can see that the one test passed, one test failed. Down here, I believe it's doc test. Yeah, we don't have any documentation test, so that should be zero. But yeah, our test passed. Our test passed. So we know it works. At this point, we can consider opportunities for refactoring the implementation of the search function while keeping the test passing to maintain the same functionality. The code in the search function isn't too bad, but it doesn't take advantage of some useful features of iterators. We'll return to this example in chapter 13, where we'll explore iterators in detail and look at how to improve it. Okay, so what they're saying here is, at this point, we have written a test and our code that we have that this test is testing works because the test is passing. So if you want to refactor your code, this is a great opportunity to do it because you now have a test that can validate whether or not your code is working as you expect it. So when you refactor, as long as you're, the code that you change and how you change it, post changing it, all the, the tests still pass, it means that you haven't broken anything. It's nice. Oh, they also said something about we didn't use iterators effectively and they're going to explain it more and we're going to return to this in chapter 13 so we could better tweak or refactor how we're doing this iteration. Okay. That's the next chapter. Hmm. Using the search function in the run function. Now that the search function is working and tested, we need to call search from our run function. We need to pass the config.query value and the contents that run reads from the file to the search function. Then run will print each line returned from search. And they have the new run function down there. So let's find ours. Here's our run. We're reading the contents from the string, or reading the contents from the file. And for line in search, print. Okay. So seemingly, the we're passing in. Uh, I'll write it first. For line in search query, it's going to be a pointer to config dot query contents print line all right so what's happening here is right we have this for loop for line in search and then we pass in the stuff Search is going to return a vector that we can iterate through. So this is going to evaluate first. And then our answers are just going to be there in a vector form. And now we're going to go through each line that's collected in this vector, in the return vector. And we're going to print it. That's straightforward enough. We are still using a for loop to return each line from search and print it. Now the entire program should work. Let's try it out. First, with a word that should return exactly one line from Emily Dickinson's poem, frog. So let's open this up, go to the bottom, and we're running poem.txt. And the word we're searching for is frog. How public, like a frog. And that is the line they returned as well, or that, that's the line they got as well. Cool. They even said cool for picking up my phrasing. Now, let's try a word that will match multiple lines, like body. All right. Body. 
I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? <laughs> How dreary to be somebody. This is a good poem. And they got those same three lines. And finally, let's make sure we don't get any lines when we search for a word that isn't anywhere in the poem, such as monomorphization. Okay? That's a word I don't feel like trying to spell. So let's copy and paste it. And we got nothing on our output, which is expected. Excellent. We've built our own mini version of a classic tool and learned a lot about how to structure applications. We've also learned a bit about file input and output, lifetimes, testing, and command line parsing. To round out this project, we will briefly demonstrate how to work with environment variables and how to print to standard error, both of which are useful when writing command line programs. Um, just before we wrap up, there's one thing I would like to state. So I kind of feel the type of way in our test, we only wrote one test and this test tested the happy path. We had content, we had query. The query is within the context, in, in the contents, and thus we returned one line. However, at the end of this section, we ran one, two, three tests. We did a query that returned one line, a query that returned multiple lines, and a query that returned nothing. If you're going to write tests, you should probably write those three tests in your test module, and then you can ensure that your functionality is going to work as expected throughout. Um, that was just a minor discrepancy, but outside of that, this is a pretty cool section. And with that, hope you learned something. Hope it was entertaining. Hope it was useful. If you like the video, subscribe. Outside of that, peace.